All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Richmond Public Library program on how the Lee Monument came down. My name is Ben Himmelfarb. I'm the Acting Library and Community Services Manager at the Main Library of Richmond Public Library. This program is going to be an opportunity to hear more from the person who led the team that literally took down the Lee Monument and is currently at work on a few others. Uh, I connected with Mr. Spence at the suggestion of Susan Revere, who's the director of the Richmond Public Library Foundation. She had gone down to the monument to see what was going on and met Mr. Spence, struck up a conversation. As you'll see, he's a gregarious and uh, brilliant individual. Um, and she said, Ben, you've got to meet Mr. Spence. So I went down and did the same thing. Both she and I were very impressed with Mr. Spence's, frankly, sometimes impromptu presentations um, to any and all who came down to the monument to gawk, marvel, and generally indulge their curiosity. As you will see, he has a lot to say and also has some great stories about what being on the ground during the work was like. Um, for my part, I just wanna say I'm always happy to meet Richmonders and come up with programs and ways that the library can support people's interests and activities. Uh, I'll share my contact information in the chat. Um, so if you have an idea for something, especially stuff related to public history um, or our city's history, um, I'm always game to talk about those things. So with that, I'm going to introduce our two panelists uh, and then let them get to it. Um, there will be time for questions and answers uh, towards the end of the presentation please throw those in the chat or the um, Q&A feature at any time, I'll be keeping track of them. So first for Michael Spence, Michael Spence is a construction superintendent with Team Henry Enterprises, who over the past decade has completed projects at NASA, the United States Naval Academy, and supervised the construction of the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers at the University of Virginia. He is currently the Manager General Partner for Construction, Safety, and Security for Team Henry's removal of the remaining Confederate pedestals in the city of Richmond. Our other panelist, Jay Dontrese Brown, is a sought after speaker on design, strategic leadership, and aligning purpose with passion. Dontrese is currently co founder of Brown Baylor, a creative strategy and marketing agency and executive director of the EDGE Center for Career Development at Randolph-Macon College. Don Treese led the historical movement and initiative to rename the Boulevard, to rename Boulevard to Arthur Ashe Boulevard and co-launched Hidden in Plain Sight, a virtual reality exploration of distinct but overlooked sites around Richmond that tell the story of the black experience throughout Richmond's history. Don Treese is also on the Richmond Public Library Foundation Board. We're very grateful for his time and uh, energy in this particular program. So with that, I will turn it over to you two and you can instruct me when you want things on the screen and I will do it. Thank you. You got it, you got it. Thanks Thank you, Ben, man. thanks for that wonderful introduction. Uh, Thank you Susan for your uh, leadership. Um, with the Richmond Public Library. And thanks for thinking of me to come in and be a part of this. Um, we, as a board, truly appreciate all that you do for us from a Richmond uh, Public Library standpoint. So, uh, and thank all of you for taking a, a Wednesday night to hear about how the monuments came down. Um, if uh, you will be uh, inspired by the conversation, uh, we're gonna kind of guide you through a little bit of you know, how it started, um, what it means, and then, you know, who this gentleman is. Uh, we're going to do it a little bit backwards because I think it would be awesome to see that. So, Mr. Spence, Michael, good evening. How are you? Don Treese, good evening to you, sir. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, man. And uh, I'm still uh, shining and excited from our conversation uh, we had a few days ago uh, in regards to uh, how the monuments came down. So, um you know, just talking in regards to specifically uh, process and logistics, um, you know, how how did the work come about? What are some of the strategies? Talk a little bit about the team and then talk about some of the challenges within that. Did Michael's 
Zoom freeze. Yeah, it looks like we've got a little, a little frozen up there. Ain't that the, ain't that the thing? <laughs> um, yeah, bear All with right, us. All right, so he's, he's going to come back in. But Don Trees, do you want to um, talk a little bit about uh, what meeting Michael was like? Um, keep yeah, going. so... Yeah, and I think you you all will be uh, excited to hear about who who Michael is uh, at the end because it ties everything together when you when you look at it from um, from a, a a historical standpoint and what he's what what he's been asked and tasked to do. Um, there's a lot of logistics and components that work in regards to taking these monuments down. It doesn't just happen by just snatching them down. There's there's science, there's there's research, there's measurements. There's a whole bunch of things that go involved in it, um, and uh, there's a sense of delicacy in, in regards to the history of these and keeping these things for for us to continue to talk about. Um, and he is just a vibrant individual with a a, a wealth of experience. Uh, he's coming back on right now. There you go. Sorry about that. Brief technical error. I have a very old laptop, which will be replaced for sure now. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. So, you know, just as our conversation we had the other day, you know, <laughs> I'd love for you to talk about the, the tactical um, uh, mechanics of taking these monuments down, uh, the work, the strategy, the team, um, and then some of the challenges. Absolutely. For, first and foremost, um, and Ben, if you could give me the, the first shot, the scaffolding um, picture. Um, the, the process of this was to erect the best scaffolding that I have ever seen in my life. And I've been in construction and hazmat for over 30 years. And uh, the scaffolding group came in. This is 40 feet in the air, Don Trees. Mm -hmm. And it had stairs. We're not we're not climbing ladders. We're yeah. doing stairs. So this was done in one day. Mm -hmm. One day, eleven guys very safely built each layer, put the walkways in, kept on going. Okay, yep. so this was December seventh. December eighth, we went to work. Ne next picture, Ben. That is the very first stone that we took off and it took us until 9.30. We started at 6 a.m. and it, it took us till 9.30 to get everything. We had two safety meetings. We prepped with the crane operator. Everything went, went well. Next picture. And that is it on the ground. And you know, we, we took a moment, some photographs were taken. But the beauty of this is how you, is the multiple options that you got. So that brings in my stone masonry group, which was phenomenal. Eight guys and a supervisor, everybody had a job. We had a ground mm -hmm. crew that made sure that stone got to the ground. We had a rigging group, which is a separate group who rigged each stone. Next picture. Mm -hmm. And this is an example of rigging. You've got the crane hook, you've got two sets of straps that are weighted for more weight than we're lifting. And that brought everything to the ground. That, that's how you end up with the stone on the ground. The process of this is chipping hammers, wedges. We have better technology now, Don Trees, than we had then. Mm -hmm. But it's still the same application of brute force. Yeah, but much more safely. It's easy to demolish, but it's really difficult to preserve. And we're, we were in the preservation business. Each stone mm -hmm. had to come out undamaged. Each stone had to be tagged in place and then set down. So the tags on it, and then we put it on a trailer and that brings in my transportation group. But yeah. I'm not gonna skip over my rigging group, which were phenomenal. I had a master rigger and his uh, journeyman rigger. So between the two, we had over 80 years of experience lifting heavy things, mm -hmm. stones, boilers, uh, chillers, air conditioning units. These were phenomenally the safest guys on earth. We would have yeah. a meeting every time before. If something deviated from the norm, because, you know, everything can get, you know, commonplace after a while. But when you see something different, 
there was a meeting between the riggers, the stonemasons, and I, and the transportation group, where do you want the truck? What does it weigh? We test with with the crane, and then we would move it. And that's that's where my safety factor came in. Yeah. The transport the transportation group, these stones had to leave Lee Circle with the Virginia State Police Escort and go to the women's work farm in Goochland. Now you drive around Richmond, you know a, a myriad of things can happen between point A and point B if you're just running out to sheets to get a cup of coffee. Right. So <laughs> imagine a 39 minute trip to the work farm carrying 50,000 pounds of stone and what that stone means and everyone can see it. We weren't covering any of this, but we did have the, the fine help of the Virginia State Police. Ne next slide, Ben. Everybody remembers the, the boutique time capsule. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but you get rewarded on jobs like this when you, when you find something that nobody expected. Now, you know, James Netherwood was, he had a bit of an ego. Uh, he was a quarry owner and, uh, and the vast majority, virtually all of this stone came from one of two quarries, Belle Isle, the quarry on the south side between Manchester and I believe Willow Garden. So that would be, to be between Route 1 and Route 161 on the south side. Beautiful stone, but he wanted to leave something of himself. We really thought this was the time capsule. We just got a present. So next slide. <laughs> and there it is again after it was removed. That stone weighs 2,500 pounds. And I, I really wanted this image because you can see the two bolts that are on top of this stone. Yeah. Okay, next slide, Ben. There's, there's the lead time capsule. And that was a glorious day because my company owner, Devon Henry found it. So he, he called, I came, I came up, we called Catherine Ridgeway, hi Kate. Uh, she's a part of the, uh, the audience tonight. And it was, it's wonderful. It's, you know, it's a treasure hunt. So there's it and it's all of its glory. Next slide, please. But I wanna show you the real absolute superstar of this entire project, which made this thing go and continues to make this thing go. And that is the Hilti quick bolt wedge anchor. These bolts are there. You drill a hole into the stone in the top, the unfinished surface. You hammer that bolt in and it expands. And mm -hmm. if you have the, the balance points all correct, you can take that, spin that bolt, uh, the, the nut off, put your, uh, your, your shackle and pad eye in, hook that to your straps, hook that to the crane, and you can lift anything in the world. Wow. These are rated, these are rated for 10,000 pounds each. And it's, you know, they didn't have this in 1877, 1887, mm -hmm. 1897. You know, it's that piece, that one piece of technology changed everything mm -hmm. so i believe that's uh, um, i believe that's the last slide we've got there but this this transportation group that was in, incredibly safe no injuries no accidents a stonemason group no injuries no accidents riggers who ne who never dropped a stone crane operator who was phenomenal and and very good to us and mm -hmm. all of that made safety and security with the Capitol Police, the Richmond uh, Police, and the Virginia State Police, everybody knew their place. They yeah. knew what they needed to do. They did it. You didn't have to ask. It, it was a wonderful experience. Yeah, and you, you talk a lot about, uh, when you and I chatted, about how um, the workings of this, how everybody has to be in sync, which is which is amazing. Um, and then we just start, we, we started to discuss, and and if you, if you can lean into the challenges of this, mm -hmm. not only the logistical challenges, but you know, the challenges you and I had talked about, lean, sure. uh, add some of those antidote, antidotes here. Um, but with that picture, if you could bring that back up, Ben, I would love for you to talk about what we're looking at so that folks can understand the, the, the scale of this and sure. the strategy, the teamwork, the cataloging, all of that stuff that went into this. This is amazing. Absolutely. This, this, what we're looking at is a grid layout. This is just the lead portion. 
So this is the, the Lee pedestal, each piece broken out, each piece in a grid on the far right hand side, that would be column A, the next two sets of pallets, column B, and you continue all the way down to column R. And I know where every stone is by tag number. Um, the, every pallet in its location and all of that is put into an Excel matrix. So if you asked me where stone V8 was, I would be able to look at my list and walk you right to it in less than 30 seconds. And this area <laughs> covers over 400 feet by 100 feet. It is a, a massive field of granite, granite that weighs 2.1 million pounds. Yeah. There, yeah. There's and, a lot and, of granite there. And, and, and for those that can't fathom that, like I couldn't fathom that, and I'm an athlete, I play football <laughs> in, in college, and I said, so in regards to a football field, give me an idea of this. So the width of this, the width of this is two mm -hmm. and a half football fields. That's correct. The height from top to bottom is what do you say around 75 yards? Yeah, of a football about three field? quarters of three quarters of a football field. Yes, sir. Three quarters of a football field. It, it is it is massive. It's a it's a good brisk walk from one end of, to the other, and it's a real walk all the way around. Yeah. Th no, this this right here just completely blew my mind in regards to the logistical process, the cataloging, the teamwork, the organization that goes into all of this, um, mm -hmm. taking specific pieces down and, and, and doing that. So I want to lean into now the discussion of um, when we talk about the process and logistics that came down. We know the work behind it. We just kind of walked through that. But sure. now talk to me a bit about what this means to you, what this means to us. Um, when you all were on site taking these things down, talk to us a little bit about how how much this meant to you and how it and what it means to us as a community, society, and as a nation. Well you you got you and I understand and and probably everyone listening the context in which these monuments had to come down i was not a part of the statues coming down but that was the beginning this is this is now a a definitive end decisions have been made and we're here now and we're doing it and and it was really emotional don trees i mean from day 1 when that first stone and there were about a hundred people around the, the circle and, and the cheering and we, we blew a horn every time a stone was moved as a safety warning. And mm -hmm. we, we had people cheering every time we heard that horn. And it, is, it, it, was, it was a jubilee to use, mm -hmm. to use the right word from, mm -hmm. from beginning to end. We, we have had people who, have, who came out every day who watched what we were doing, who would come to the fence and talk to me and say how much they appreciated. And that made this such a beautiful experience. Yeah. Because to me, these, these statues, these monuments had been transformed. Right. They, were, they were now works of art. Uh, when I met Susan Revere and Ben Hemelfarb, I said, this is our Berlin Wall. Yeah, this yeah. is this is a Berlin Wall moment for us, and you know, and they need to be preserved. They don't. This mm -hmm. isn't something that okay, we need to move these monuments to make this situation go away. Taking these of uh, taking these monuments, these pedestals down, and giving gives us an opportunity to give the spaces new life, and to give the monuments themselves new life. Mm -hmm. And you you can definitely contextualize this in the proper way by displaying them now, because they're no longer objects of fear, they're now objects of learning and information and understanding. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's what it means to me. You know, I've, yeah. I've been, and the other challenge, which you know, I hope everybody will be comfortable with this part of the discussion, because yeah. real talk, this is what happened. I have been, um, and my team, not just directed at me, there have been a lot of racial slurs by mm -hmm. people, but it's it's never anybody 
coming up to the fence, walking into the job site, you know, near going across the crosswalk, it's always somebody going 25, 30, or 40 miles an hour in their car. And that that explains a lot. Mm-hmm. So they, you know, it's it's hard to have anonymity when you're riding down Monument Avenue. <laughs> no so, doubt. But that that's where, but I have had some people come up to me and strike up a conversation and say yeah. that, you know, I had one gentleman uh two weeks ago at um Stonewall Jackson, you know, t- accuse me of destroying history. And I'm like, no, all the stones are being preserved. We can put these back together in museums or put e- individual pieces on display so you can see what was built and give the context in history. And he said, we should have left them up because then we wouldn't know what a traitor to the union would look like. <laughs> and that's when, that's when I asked him, did you go to a, any council meetings and say that? He said, no. So, I mean, you know, hindsight is 2020, but, you know, these, these monuments, my opinion, not the opinion of my company or, you know, or anybody else, but they were put up to instill fear and make people feel like they were superior to others mm-hmm. when the, when they when they represented you know treason and defeat. Right, right. And you talked a little bit. You know, one of the the things I enjoyed about a conversation is uh, those challenges um, of those those racial slurs and the things that your team had to deal with. Um, mm-hmm. And you mentioned in our last conversation around the three groups of individuals. Sure. Um, what, will you talk a little bit about those three groups of individuals and, and where you sit within those three groups? Okay. Well, that's, you know, that was part of the beauty of the process was meeting these people because you had, you had a group that wanted those monuments to stay up at all costs. And Don Therese, a, that was a monolithic, uniform group of white people. Mm-hmm. Most of them that talked to me were between the ages of 50 and 75. Then you had a middle group that wanted the pedestals to stay up because they were beautiful and represented the protest and the unity and they could be gathering points in the future. And then you had, and that was a predominantly black and Latino and an LGBT group. And they were, they gave great reasons why this should be done. We should build new things around it. And then you had the final group that were like, we need to take them down. And that was actually the largest group. And they were 50-50 white and black, people who lived on Monument Avenue, people who lived in Carytown or Shaco Bottom, uh, you know, Churchill, they need to come down. Mm -hmm. I fall into that last group because I believe they need to be put in museums and the real context of black history, which is American history. You know, our history is the history of America. We built this. Those monuments were built with black hands. Mm-hmm. You know, when they, when they feathered in, when they drilled the holes in the quarry at Netherwood and the guys hammering the pen in to bust the feather to cleave the stone, those were black men. Mm-hmm. So, we, we need to tell that story to our children. That is our history. The, you know, we, we don't know where we come from, many of us, but we can know where we've been. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I do fall into that latter category. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I was one who uh, was in that middle category uh, of leaving the, the pedestals up. Mm-hmm. Um, just because of your statement, which I think was so eloquently put about the lead pedestal being our Berlin Wall. Yes. Um, can, you, can you just lean into that just a little bit more? Because I, I really think that was a powerful statement uh, so, that, so that folks can actually feel what that means. I was, I was in Marathon, Florida, uh, as far away from the mainland as you can get of the United States without being in Alaska. <laughs> and I was working, I was doing a job with the Coast Guard. And I'm watching this on television. I'm watching my people, people that I work with every day, my company owner, our superintendents, the same transportation group that I worked with when we when we took down the pedestal. And they're taking Robert E. Lee down. I, they took Stonewall Jackson down. You know, but when they took Lee down, you know, it, I, I remember I'm, I was sitting in my parents' house eating dinner when I saw the Berlin Wall come down. Mm-hmm. And I was eating a steak and onions. 
And when I saw Lee come down, I was eating the steak and onions. It was surreal. <laughs> and and that is, it, it is really that moment, the Berlin Wall coming down freed the East German people and freed the people behind the Iron Curtain, people of Hungary, of the Czech Republic, of, mm -hmm. of Romania, of Bulgaria. That was their moment of freedom. This was our third emancipation. Mm -hmm. It was our third to the you know, monuments that were put up in the name of white supremacy to build an all white community where we would never have a chance to live in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That was what was in those people's minds. Mm -hmm. So, and now we've got a, a freedom moment. And, you know, we, we were emancipated by the power of the United States Congress and the, the, the will of Abraham Lincoln. Then we were emancipated by the Civil Rights Act from by, by Lyndon Baines Johnson through the hard work of everybody who fought and struggled, black, white, brown, and otherwise in the civil rights era of the 1960s, 50s, 40s, yeah. 50s, and 60s. This yeah. was a physical third emancipation of the people. Yeah. It yeah, really yeah. was. No, and that was powerful when you when you put it in that perspective. Um, as we if we had our last chat, I thought it was uh, super important to make sure that folks understand what that sure. means, because I think it is a powerful statement. You know, we also talked about, you know, of course, what this means for us and what this means for our nation. But um, I want to know where you think we go from here. You, you, you made a comment that was really, really powerful in mm -hmm. ideas and not people. Yeah. So talk about that a little so bit. We, we have to if, if we're looking for unity, if that's the goal, Don Trace, mm -hmm. then, you know, if any person that you that you put up, I've got a good friend of mine is a photographer. He's been a photographer for over 50 years. He's been out following everything I've been doing for the last two months. And he said, you know, everybody thought Richard Pryor was funny. But you if you put Richard Pryor up on a pedestal out here, somebody would hate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Mother Teresa, the Virgin Mary, Christ, somebody would find fault with any person that you put there. But how on earth could you find fault with love, kindness, compassion, unity, hope, and faith? Mm -hmm. And if, if you have artists out there, if there's an artist listening to my voice right now, if you can abstract those concepts you got a beautiful Monument Avenue that's really monumental. That becomes Monument Avenue. That if people were worried about their property values going down if you took those Confederate soldiers down. I can see a, a winged uh, a version of love on Libby Hill that everybody can rally around. Compassion. Yeah. You know, a, a, a sculpture, it doesn't have to be human figures, just something that exudes compassion, faith, love, hope, understanding, all of those things, all the things that we need right now in this country and in the world, Don Trees. That's what yeah. should go on Monument Avenue. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I totally love that. Um, uh, we need to move and support ideas, not people. Um, That's right. Uh, and so, you know, now I want to I want to switch gears a little bit, you know, <laughs> as we get into the last session before we we start to get some Q&A here. Um, I hope you don't mind me sharing this. I will be 50 sure. in, in September. Oh, you're um, going to make me I, tell tell people how old I am? Yes. That wasn't that wasn't the deal, Don Trace. <laughs> <laughs> I've got you. Um, I'm, I'm 56 years old. Yes, and and I, I say I I ask him to share that because this gentleman has has been to a hundred and twelve different countries, um, and when you hear about who he is, you will realize why his purpose in life was meant for him to be a part of this. Yeah, it's just yeah. a tremendous, uh, it's a tremendous flow and growth of who he is. So. Mm -hmm. Let's let our let's let our fifty uh, viewers on here. Who is Michael Spence? Well, I'm a I'm the product of two good parents. My father, Leroy Spence Jr., was a uh, was a civil servant. He worked at the Naval Supply Center in Norfolk. He uh, rose through the ranks and he retired as a GS-15. 
He was a general foreman in charge of all four of the warehouses at um, at all four of the piers at the Naval Supply Center in Norfolk. So he was a very poor child. He he paid attention, went to Catholic school, you know, went in the Navy in World War II, you know, came out of the Navy as a as a chief petty officer, gave me the values that I needed. My mother was uh, was pretty well to do growing up. They they had businesses. Her father worked for the Seaboard Coastline Railroad, and she became a veterinarian. She did veterinary surgery in, uh, in Portsmouth, in Chesapeake, Virginia. So I had a really nice upbringing. I had a, I, it was cushy, but it wasn't easy because they gave me <laughs> yeah. the value of work. At 12, <laughs> no my doubt. father gave me a lawnmower and said, go cut some neighbor's grass and make some money and learn the value of a dollar. <laughs> and I turned that into a little business that I ended up selling before I went to college. So I uh, went to college in Connecticut. That, that turned out really well, and but I, I wanted to do something that my father had done. So I joined the Navy. I became a hospital corpsman. I went through the State Department shot program, and that's how I visited 112 countries in three and a half years. They keep mm -hmm. you busy. So then, then I came back home, and there was, you know, I took a, took a break from my naval career, and I went abroad and did some oil and gas. And, uh, and then I came back home and, you know, I was looking for some direction. I went into hazmat and that was like a boom. That was a real boom. And, uh, cause I've always loved chemistry and I got to do that for nine years. Uh, did a little ship breaking with my cousin, Denson Spence. And, uh, that, that gets me to 2010 when Denson took a job with team Henry and that's how I ended up here. But it's. <laughs> It's, it's been, you know, when, when I compress it like that, I'm like, wow, that is exactly how I ended up here. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's mm -hmm. my parents, man, really. I can't, you know, God rest their souls. That's, that's why I'm the man that I am. And that, yeah. that gave me a thirst for learning and, a, and an yeah. understanding that, that we're all human beings. You know, you've got to put all of the rest of that stuff aside. Everything, everything that you've been taught that's negative, you just got to let it go. It's, it's like being slurred on a job site. It, it, I'm not going to lie and say it doesn't hurt. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, having, yeah. having new friends that I've met in Richmond, meet, meeting brothers like you that, that know what the deal is, yeah. that, are, that, are, that are striving and struggling and succeeding, this, this makes all of that go away. Because I'm, I'm not those things that they say I am. I am me. Yeah, and and, uh, and and that's what I love about you. If if we could have had a camera when you and I were sitting at the, um, at the bar having this conversation and looking at the folks, look at us like, oh my gosh, they're talking about these things. No one in, engaged in the conversation with us. Right. But, you know, they they really, you know, it was interesting to see that dynamic. Um, but they because those are, yeah, those are the dynamics that when you and I have a conversation like that, that's mm -hmm. the type of response we get. Um, this is true. And if folks want to engage in that conversation, we're more than welcome to say, let's Come have the conversation. Come on in. Our, Don um, Trees, our people are the most inviting people in, that, that God made. So, yes. but, the, and, and then I had a little moment there and I'm thinking if this was 1922, we would oh, have yeah. been able to have that conversation out loud. We would have had to no. whisper it outside. No, no question about it. No How question. About that? Yeah, and talk a little bit about your your love of history, your educational background in history, because I think that ties into, again, who you are and why you're in this position right now. Like, like I said, when we met at Hill Cafe, this is, history is a process. Now, I studied Ottoman history, and it, it, it is fascinating because Turkey is the bridge between Asia and Europe. And if you could, and, and whoever controlled that bridge was going to be one of the most powerful forces in the world. You control mm -hmm. trade routes that stretched from all the way to Samarkand in the Russian Empire and to, to Xinjiang in, uh, in China, places that we hear about now because of, of strife and suffering. And you also can, you, though that spice road trade came through Turkey, crossed the Bosphorus and went on to Western Europe to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, to the Holy Roman Empire, to the Republic of France, to the, to the Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which yeah. controlled the Irish Republic then. That level of study 
To understand the Ottoman Turks, you've got to understand medieval England. You've got to understand you know, medieval Russia. It, the depth of that type of, of study gives you a better perspective when you have to learn something on the fly. I am yeah. a very quick study. I am, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. The smartest guy in the room ends up doing most of the work. I'm the laziest man I know. <laughs> so I, I, I would prefer to be prepared. And the preparation is the process. And that's what history does for you, because the only thing new in the world is the history you don't know. I, yeah. I will absolutely. Am, recently, I read uh, Hillary Mantel's Wolf Hall series about the life of Henry VIII. Mm hmm. And, and in the midst of it, and while I was halfway through book two, why isn't there, why hasn't somebody written the history of the empire of Ghana, right. which was far richer, or, or a history of Mansa Musa, who was the richest man in the world at one point, still yep. possibly the wealthiest man who ever lived. I mean, he devalued the price of gold on his holidays to Mecca. And this was an 11th century cat. So when yeah, it was yeah, dark yeah. in Europe, he was loaded. So we, we need to <laughs> teach more of this and teach the process. Yeah, and, and I, 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 I love that. And I just love, um, you know, in the space that we are here, I just love uh, hearing, hearing, hearing smart brothers, right? Just, <laughs> you know, those that, 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 um, that can back what, what, whatever conversation there is that is, sure. that are open to conversations of change and, um, coming together, inclusivity, those types of things sure, are, are sure. super important. And you well, and I, as Corn I mean, we, we, go ahead. As Cornell West would say, diversity of thought. Diversity of thought. You know, yes. everybody has one thing they're really good at, but it, it never hurts to have, a, to have, you don't have to dive into the Pacific Ocean, but you can have a swimming pool of knowledge about everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, People stop learning. I know. And, and, and so, you know, before we, well, uh, one last thing, before we get into questions, um, uh, 112 countries yeah. and, and, and he didn't cover the fact that he, he, he cooked for someone um, that uh, took care yeah. of him really, really well. Um, That's true. So he spent some time doing some cooking as well, but right, you know, right. to my question that we had the other day, you know, out of the 112 countries, once you hang it up, where are you going to go, man? It is if if you know I I love this union I wore the uniform of this union, but you know there's a there's every chance that things could get really bad here soon, Don Trees. Because um, I, I I saw this in I saw this in my study of history in post Weimar Germany. So you know we're we're not on the same road. We're on a different road, but it leads to the same destination. Yeah. So. I would, uh, I would, and as I said to you in, in the Hill Cafe, Botswana. Botswana is a beautiful country. It's, uh, it's uh, resource rich and the people control their resources as opposed to foreign countries. They have a, a great GDP. They're very welcoming to, uh, to expatriates who want to come and start a business there. And they need things built too. They're building at the second fastest pace on, on the African continent right now. Yeah. Gabarone, Botswana, you know, and this is the other, I have one more thing before we go to Q&A. Africa is not a country. Africa is a continent made up of over 60 countries. Yeah. So if people want to learn something, they're like, well, you know, I don't know what to learn. It's new. Get a map, pick a country every week in Africa. It could be Western Sahara. It could be Senegal. It could be Angola. It could be Eritrea. Pick a country, go to the Wikipedia page and read about it. Mm -hmm. Read about it, you know, mm -hmm. and find out that Africa is more than some deep dark continent that isn't a, that isn't North America, that mm -hmm. is full of vibrant people who are living positive lives and changing things. And you really want something? Congolese, the Democratic Republic of Congo. I love Kinshasa. It is a beautiful city. And that country is full of beautiful people, but most Americans remember it as Zaire, and all they know yeah. about it is Ebola happens there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They have they have the they have the largest peat area, fifty thousand square miles along the Congo yeah. River. Yeah, and yeah. it was in the New York Times, and I'm like, wow, something else, 
something yeah. else beautiful in Congo. So I'm ready yeah. for Q&A now. I'm, I'm well, yakking. Well, yeah, no, and, and we talked about this when we were sitting there. We could talk all day about this. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is Mr. Michael Spence. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Michael, to give us some parting words. Uh, but sure. Frank Dukes has a question now. Um, I wonder how you might compare the meaning of the work you did in this removal with the work you did constructing UVA's memorial for enslaved peoples. Um, well, good evening, Frank. Uh, it's, it's good to hear from you. I'm glad you joined. Um, Mr. Dukes is a good friend. Um, it's, it's intersectional. It's, it's, I, you know, I looked at this as demolition initially, but it's not, it's not, it's, it's, you know, preservation. So as the memorial to enslaved laborers in, in Charlottesville preserves the memory of the people who worked without pay in bondage to build that, that beautiful university, we are equally preserving, you know, the, the removal of these monuments is, is preservation in itself. It is, the, it is the taking down of memorials to people who enslaved. So it's one, one is building something new and one is building, building something new also just by the removal. So thank you, Franklin. Excellent, excellent. Any other questions? So we do have another question from Irene Thomas. Who are some of the people, civil rights heroes, communities, you would like to see replace Confederate statues, monuments, living and from our history? You know, we, we talked earlier about, you know, we don't, I don't want, my personal view is I, I like ideas over individuals, <laughs> ideas over people. But if I had to choose a person, ma'am, I would, um, it would be Pauli Murray. Pauli Murray was a phenomenally great woman, and she, she was she was brilliant. I, I have her book of of black state of state laws as they applied to African Americans. It is a legal book. She compiled it, and it was what you could and could not do legally as a black man or woman in the United States. Laws that were passed in the South and in other states. I mean, Oregon had laws against, you know, against intermarried marriage across the races and how many black people could gather at a time. This, this is such a detailed history that it is, it is an absolute must have, you know, book to have in your, in your library. Mm -hmm. And to see how far things have changed and also to see how much they have. So, and she, she was also a member of the LGBTQ community. She's a woman and she was, just whip smart. And if you had to put, uh, and that's, that's Pauly Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y, Pauly Murray. Excellent. So we've got a couple of questions coming in here. Uh, one is, how can you best share our history? How can we best share our history with our youth? That's from Meldon Jenkins Jones. Well, I tell you one thing that, that we need to do is we need Black History every day as opposed to Black History Month. Okay. Um, it's- Fact, fact. It is, we, we, can't, we can't do this in 28 days because American history, it, it, Black history is American history. You know, if it, I would, I would posit, and people may disagree with this, it's just my opinion. Um, I don't know how America becomes America without the effort of African-Americans. I don't know. I mean, I, I, don't see, I don't see the people who came to Georgia building that, that state. I don't see the people who came to Virginia who almost died before 1612. I don't see them getting where they are with, without our efforts, whether it was as enslaved laborers or as freedmen. So it's, you know, it, it's a harsh path to have to take to build a country like America through slave labor. But at the end of the day, we, we built this country and it needs to be told. Yeah, yeah, that's a powerful statement when you look at it from that perspective. And 
Um, I won't lean in too much about our project hidden in plain sight, but that's the focus is, is telling those, mm -hmm. those narratives. So uh, we got a native from the 757 and they want to know um, what high school you attended. I went to Israel Charles Norcom High School in Portsmouth, Virginia. Yet, yet another reason I'm who I am. Go, <laughs> go Greyhounds. <laughs> so, you know, uh, let's see, do we have any, I'm looking for any other Q&A. Um, so let's see, book recommended, so we got that. So mm -hmm. in regards to telling the our history, um, how do we go about making sure that we're capturing these stories from our elders because one mm -hmm. of the things that in in today's world when our elders are gone mm -hmm. none the matter the historically underrepresented group doesn't matter you list any historically underrepresented group once those elders are gone the those stories are gone right and right, right. so talk 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 a little bit about what we need to do as a community as a society to ensure that these narratives are being told we we have here's where our young people our our 14 to 18 year olds can step in and do the history i, I don't want them to throw the xbox away i just like them to pick up a recorder that the library of congress has this great opportunity that they've given us called story Corps. and you can send a recording via email wave file, Og Vorbis file, and send that to StoryCorps. And sit down with your grandma, sit down with your, your grandfather, sit down with your great uncle, and ask them what was it like then, and record it and send it to StoryCorps. And it'll be archived. And then mm -hmm. then other then you can take your they can take their children and know what it's like. Mm -hmm. Because you know yeah. An, an oral tradition ends if the storyteller dies, like you said. And that's how you preserve that tradition. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Uh, any other questions in the Q&A or in the chat, please feel free to drop something in. We have a few more minutes left. Um, May I uh, offer Mr. Spence a question? Absolutely. So Mr. Spence, this is Ben from the library. Sure. You are someone who strikes me as a lifelong learner, which yeah. is a trendy way of uh, saying something that's been around for a long time, of course, and public libraries are very much about self-directed learning. And mm -hmm. one thing that interested me so much meeting you and getting to know you is how interdisciplinary you are. You don't see a boundary mm -hmm. between geology and history and cuisine and politics and, no. you know. Um, and I was wondering if you, w what's, what's been your experience with how you teach yourself things, with how you learn, with who you learn from? I, you, that, that is a really good question. I have been, I have been accused of being an autodidact in the past. <laughs> um, but, but I can't, I, there are things that i that I have tried to do that take a little bit more effort, like learning how to do a brake job on a car. I can do it, but I wouldn't trust doing it because you know there's always that that level of human error, and brakes are nothing to just mess around with. Um, but when it comes to whether whether it's it's you know mathematics or chemistry or politics or history or philosophy, uh, it once again, it's a process. How you learn things is a process. If, if the, 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 the easy part, Ben, is the information is in front of me in this box via these wires. There is no longer, and I can't learn anything because that doesn't apply to me, but because I'm a, I'm a peasant farmer in a village and there's no electricity and no internet, okay. I'll give you a pass if you were lived between 900 in 1900. In the modern era, in the age of the, the real library where everybody had access to books, since Gutenberg, we really don't have a whole lot of excuse. And now we've got the internet and I love, I love real books, you know, uh, but you know, it's, it's one of those things 
you've got to want to learn. Mm -hmm. We've got, we, you know, people want to learn. It has to be inherent. You know, there are people that once they get to the, the, the ease of comfort in their lives, I, I got to go to Cornell West again. Once you get to a ease of comfort and you are satisfied, a lot of people stop learning. They've got, the, they've got a job that pays their bills. They've got a mate. They've got shelter. They've got a reasonable portion of health. They've got it made. That's, that's not how this works, people. God gave you a brain. Use it. That's what my father <laughs> would say. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Yeah, and thanks for that question, Ben. Um, mm. Michael, we got two more questions. I'm going to go to sure. Brian Green first. Um, when you first finished removing the Lee Monument pedestal, what was it like to look at the newly cleared site? What did you feel? Do you look at that moment differently now with the passage of some time? I, um, we got, we got done on the, um, 31st of December. And, um, uh, I was there with my, my assistant superintendent and, uh, the straw and the seed was done. And I came across the street and, and, and I, um, I lit a cigar <laughs> and, uh, and I, I smoked a good cigar and relaxed. And when everybody was gone and I was on my way home, I turned around and I looked at that, that, that empty open space with straw and seed on it. And uh, I sat in my car for about 10 minutes and cried. It's, it, it's no sense in, you know, in, in denying it. It was, uh, it, it was really, really emotional. Cause all I could think about was, was, you know, how many times my parents had been to Richmond and and passed by Monument Avenue and they yep. they had to see this larger than life statue of a man revered by people who had marched in hoods in Washington DC in 1925. Mm -hmm. And now it's gone. But it's not destroyed because you know, Don Trees, we're not destroyers. Right. We're right. preservers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and of course, uh, Mr. Mr. Devin Henry uh, just reflected on you being the, the perfect human to lead this historical project and how proud the team of is of your leadership. Um, That's we got boss, a question. Man. We got a question from Joshua Duncan, and this is not shallow, Joshua, because I have some of the same questions. Is so it about my, food? Uh, yes, it's you've okay. visited 112 countries. You know, what's your favorite meal? It's going to sound really, really shallow when I say what my favorite meal to eat abroad in my favorite city on earth, which is Rome, is spaghetti carbonara. It's it's a hundred percent spaghetti carbonara, and my favorite restaurant in Rome is Bar Cinque Lune <laughs> at Piazza Navona, with a night with a nice big glass of white wine and a bowl of olives and somebody to sit and talk to. It could be anybody. Because, yeah. you know, it's nice to talk while you eat, you know, if you're face to face. Now, if I'm on the phone and my food's in front of me, the people who know me know I'll call you back. Yeah. So, but spaghetti carbonara, it, it's, it's a slam dunk. Yeah. You know, it's so funny, Mike, because Michael, it's so funny because you are so easy to talk to. And um, you told me about, you know, gathering with folks last Friday and just sure. kind of hanging out with them and having conversations because sure. you enjoy that, that knowledge share, that companionship, which sure. I think says a lot about you and who you are. Uh, and I'd love to be able to continue our friendship as we, sure. as we move sure. along with doing great things. Um, Susan Rivers asks, do you ever do presentations in schools? Uh, so many kids could learn as much from you and the story of your own personal and professional journey. That is a wonderful thing. The headmistress, and I apologize if she's if she's watching. I apologize. I can't remember your name. I am fifty six years old. <laughs> um, the uh, the headmistress of the Orchard School asked me to give a talk to her her classes. It's middle school, all girls, uh, North. Allen near Lee Circle. Um, and they came to the median across from the, and I gave them a presentation and it was wonderful. And I, I do do things like that. My, my company owner invited me to back to Charlottesville to talk to the Jack and Jill group that his wife is a part of. 
Um, and that was wonderful. And that's where the picture for the, the advert for this comes from. I was in April of last year. I will talk to anybody about something I'm passionate about. And I'm passionate about a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So we're getting close to time. Uh, I do want to give you the last word um, uh, before we pass it back over to, to Ben. Uh, I always love to give nuggets. Uh, I had a, an uncle who played in the Negro Leagues. That's why I'm wearing this hey, shirt. And every time, I would talk, every time I would talk to him, he would say, I'm going to give you a little something to put in your back pocket. You use right. it when you feel the appropriate times to use it. So as a tangible item, give us something to put in our back pocket that we can walk away from this conversation and then tomorrow possibly be, be able to put something in play or something that inspires us to continue to walk the right way. It's, it's the easiest thing in the world. And it's, it's a three-part thing. If you see somebody who's struggling, don't ask them how they are because they're going to say, I'm fine. Ask them what they need. That's one. Number two, spend with before you walk out of your home to, to go out into the world every day, look in a mirror and say, be nice. Look at that person in the mirror and tell them, which is you, tell them to be nice. I do it every day here in the hotel. Before I go out, I look at that mirror and I, I do this. It's a mantra. Be nice. And do something nice for yourself every day. It doesn't have to be expensive. It can be, it can be some self-care where you just walk out and, and stand in a field of grass next to a tree. If you see a dog, pet it. You know, if you if you need a laugh, look at something funny for five minutes. Take care of yourself. Nobody's going to take care of you. You've got to take care of yourself. Those are my three things. That's awesome. That's awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you so much for attending. You have heard from the amazing, wonderful Michael Spence. Uh, my name is Don Therese Brown, uh, a part of the board at the Richmond Public Library, and a pleasure to be here. Ben, I'll pass it back over to you uh, to wrap us up. Well, thank you both, Michael and Don Therese. That was uh, more amazing than I could ever have imagined. Um, this will be recorded, it was recorded, and I will get it up as quickly as possible and share it with everyone who registered and with both of you as well. I wanna to say to both of you that I hope this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship and uh, continued relationship with Richmond Public Library. We're committed to uh, doing more around local history, public history, um, and filling those niches that maybe aren't being uh, you know, filled other ways. So uh, you'll be hearing more from us on this front. And uh, to everyone, I say good night, be well, and be nice. Be nice. Thank be you. Bye-bye. Nice. Thanks, Michael. We'll be in touch, my friend. All righty.